Johnson, Madison. Professor Nader is a scholar, most notably of early modern philosophy, including Descartes and Cartesian philosophy, Spinoza and Leibniz. Uh, but his research also focuses on uh, medieval and early modern Jewish philosophy. In 2008, he held the Spinoza chair at the University of Amsterdam, and in 2015, he was scholar in residence at the American Academy in Rome. Professor Nadler is the author of numerous articles and many books, too many to mention them all. Uh, the most recent are uh, Menashe Ben Israel, the most famous Jew in the world, forthcoming in Yale University Press. The philosopher, the priest, and the painter, a portrait of Descartes, and a book forged in hell, Spinoza's uh, scandalous treatise, and the birth of the secular age whose Hebrew translation we are celebrating today. Sefer Shechushal Bagenom, Spinoza Veuledet Eidan Amoderni, Achiloni, Shiyatza Botzat Idiot Sfarim. This excellent book provides a fascinating, a fascinating portrait of Spinoza's scandalous theological political treatise, which is remarkably relevant to our own day and unfortunately to the situation in Israel in particular. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank uh, the Van Leer Institute and Shulamit Laron for this um, arranging so beautifully this uh, event. And uh, so let us give Nadler a very warm welcome. Um, <laughs> the, the title of the lecture is Spinoza on the Divinity of Scripture. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Um, thank you very much. It's a real honor to be giving this lecture here tonight, uh, and I thank you for coming out for it. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the themes that uh, appears in the book, Spinoza's view on the status of the Hebrew Bible. One of Spinoza's more famous, influential, and to his contemporaries, incendiary doctrines concerns the origin and the status of Scripture as this is presented in his scandalous theological political treatise. The Bible, he argues, is not literally authored by God. That is, the Bible's text was not composed or dictated by some transcendent providential deity endowed with the psychological and moral characteristics required for the kind of providential agency traditionally attributed to the Abrahamic God. For Spinoza, God is nature. And as such, God or nature is metaphysically incapable of proclaiming or dictating or commanding, much less writing, anything. As Spinoza puts it, Scripture is not a book God has sent men from heaven. Um, rather than saying quote or go like this, whenever I assume a kind of divine tone of voice, that means I'm quoting from Spinoza. <laughs> Does everybody have a copy of the handout, by the way? Because we'll be referring to some text there. Rather, scripture is a very ordinary, mundane document. Texts from a number of authors of various socioeconomic backgrounds, writing at different points of time over a long stretch of history, and in different historical and political circumstances, these texts were passed down through generations in copies after copies after copies. Finally, a selection of these writings, made, Spinoza insists, with some contingency and arbitrariness, a selection was put together in the Second Temple period, most likely under the editorship of Ezra, who was able only partially to synthesize his sources, and create a single work of, out of them. Subsequently, this imperfectly composed collection was itself subjected to the various changes that naturally creep in when a text is transmitted over many centuries. The Bible, then, as we have it, and as Spinoza's contemporaries had it, is thus a work of human literature, 
and he says a rather faulty, mutilated, corrupted, and inconsistent one at that. It is a mixed breed by its birth and corrupted by its descent and preservation. It is a jumble of texts by different hands, from different periods and for different audiences. Spinoza supplements his theory of the origins of scripture with an equally deflationary account of its authors. The prophets were not especially learned individuals. They did not enjoy a high degree of education or intellectual sophistication. They certainly were not philosophers or scientists. And here, Spinoza explicitly departs from Maimonides, who insists that the prophets have the same endowment as philosophers, but they have something special. What this means is that the biblical texts are, for the most part, not to be read as sources of truth. Again, contrary to Maimonides, who says that if the Bible proclaims uh, a proposition, that proposition must be true. The Bible's authors, on Spinoza's account, were not physicists or astronomers. So there are no truths about nature or the cosmos to be found in their writings. Joshua apparently did believe that the, earth, that the sun revolved around the earth. But neither is the Bible the source of metaphysical or even theological truths. The prophets often had simple, naive, even philosophically false beliefs about God. Therefore, much of what the Bible says about things, including God, are false. There is, however, at least one major truth to be gleaned from all of Scripture. It's a truth that he says comes through loud and clear in a non-mutilated form. The ultimate teaching of scripture, he says, whether the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Gospels, is in fact a rather simple one. Practice justice and loving kindness to your fellow human beings. That's the message of scripture. That's the truth it proclaims. Of course, Spinoza notes, there are other equally fundamental principles that follow from this universal declaration. For example, that God exists, that God provides for all, that God is omnipotent, that in accordance with God's decree, things go well with the pious, but badly for the wicked, that our salvation depends only on God's grace. There's a chair over here. Spinoza says, scripture teaches these things everywhere clearly. Moreover, from these general propositions, a number of more particular prescriptive moral precepts naturally follow, necessarily follow. Scripture implies that we should defend justice, aid the poor, kill no one, covet nothing belonging to another, and so on. These are also moral truths proclaimed by Scripture. That um, there's more chairs around here, people who are. That's not part of my lecture. This is, uh, I didn't prepare that. That basic moral message, to love God above all else and to love your neighbor as yourself, that moral message and its theological and ethical ramifications, this is the point of all of the commandments and the lesson of all of the stories of Scripture, surviving whole and unadulterated through all the differences of language and all the copies, alterations, corruptions, and scribal errors that have crept into the text over the centuries. It is Spinoza insists the message of the Hebrew prophets, and it is also in Paul's letters. Spinoza writes, this I can certainly affirm, that I have not noticed concerning moral teachings any error or any alternative reading which would make them obscure or doubtful. That's a very odd claim to make, but we're going to leave that alone for now. The moral doctrine, he says, is the clear and universal message of the Bible, at least for those who are not prevented from reading it properly by prejudice, superstition, or the thirst for political power. Scripture conveys this moral message not only through the visions of the prophets, but especially through its portrayal of a particular character named God, a character who is wise, just, and merciful, 
Spinoza allows that there is no expectation that everyone is to come to know God's true attributes, God's essential nature, an intellectual or exact understanding of God. That's for an elite, for the philosophers who can follow the demonstrations presented in Spinoza's metaphysical treatise, The Ethics. But it is incumbent upon even the non-philosophical masses to obey the word of God, he says. And this means believing in God's justice and charity and emulating those traits in your own actions. This is quote number one on the handout. Obedience to God consists only in the love of your neighbor, the knowledge that God through the prophets has demanded of everyone without exception is nothing but knowledge of his divine justice and loving kindness. In short, Spinoza has thoroughly naturalized and even secularized scripture. The Bible is a very historical product of human literary endeavor, and its overall message is simply to treat our fellow human beings with justice and charity. But now we have the question, does Spinoza believe that there remains any sense in which it can be said that the Bible is divine. Certainly not in the sense central to fundamentalist or even traditional versions of the Abrahamic religions, which would seem to require a providential, even anthropomorphic God as author. Scripture is not literally divine in its origin or its composition. But Spinoza does still want to maintain a non-trivial understanding of the divinity of Scripture one that preserves scripture's distinctness, if not its uniqueness, as a sacred book. We'll come back to that issue about the uniqueness of a sacred book. And that distinctiveness, he argues, lies both in scripture's message and in the particularly effective and affective way that that message is conveyed. For Spinoza, the divinity of scripture and in fact, the divinity of any work of literature or art is a purely functional and relational property. Just as being a corkscrew does not require having a certain causal origin or being made out of a certain material or possessing a certain physical form, but being a corkscrew only requires being suited for performing a certain function. That is the function that a corkscrew essentially performs, removing a cork from a bottle. Well, so likewise, a work of literature or art is divine, according to Spinoza's understanding, only because it is composed or created in such a way that it serves especially well for having a particular effect upon readers or viewers. Spinoza insists, first, that scripture is sacred and divine, both because it contains that message of God, loving kindness and mercy, and because it does an especially good job of presenting that message. What is the word of God? What is that divine, that universal divine law that scripture proclaims? It's precisely what we have just seen it to be, namely the message that remains unmutilated and uncorrupted throughout the biblical text. Love your neighbors and treat them with justice and charity. This is quote number two on the handout. From scripture itself, we have perceived its most important themes without any difficulty or ambiguity, to love God above all else and to love your neighbor as yourself. But the second equally important aspect of scripture's divinity is that perhaps more than any other work of literature, scripture is exceptionally good at motivating people to follow that divine message and emulate God's justice and charity in their lives. And it has that special feature just because it conveys that divine message so clearly and effectively and movingly. In other words, the divinity of scripture lies in the fact that it is, above all else, an especially morally edifying work of literature. Spinoza claims that those who, in the right frame of mind, read scripture and its account of a God who exercises and delights in loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the world, a God who is supremely just and supremely merciful, such readers come both to a proper knowledge of God and God's actions, 
and our, through scripture's literary portrayal of this exemplary moral character, inspired to act with similar justice and charity towards others. The thing is, however, that what is true for scripture, this ability to motivate people to be just and charitable towards others, can in principle be true for other works of human literature. This is not a point that Spinoza explicitly makes, but we'll see that he may concede it in one of his letters. So if reading Shakespeare's Tempest or Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn moves you toward justice and charity, or if reading Charles Dickens' Hard Times inspires you toward love and charity towards the poor, then these works, too, are divine and sacred. The word of God, Spinoza says, is not contained in a certain number of books. In a letter to Spinoza, one of his early correspondents objects that according to Spinoza's theological political treatise, and this is the quote from the letter from the subjector, if what you say is true, then the Quran too is to be put on a level with the word of God, since the Turks too, in obedience to the command of their prophet, cultivate those moral virtues about which there is no disagreement among nations. Now, I think Spinoza's correspondent is expecting Spinoza to respond by saying, oh, well, no, that can't be. I don't mean that. But no, Spinoza says, yeah, that's right. Spinoza acknowledges the implication. But he doesn't regard it as an objection. He sees no problem in allowing there to be other true prophets besides those of Hebrew scripture nor in allowing there to be other books outside the Jewish and Christian canons that are divine and sacred. Therefore, if the reader of a book is moved to devotion, then the words on the page are sacred. Conversely, if a work of literature fails to have such an effect on a reader, then whatever may be its origins and whoever its author may be, it is without value and sanctity, he says. In a word, it is not divine. This is quote number three. Words have a definite meaning only from their use. If they should be so organized that according to their usage, they move the people reading them to devotion, then those words will be sacred. So will a book written with the words organized that way. But if afterward the usage should be lost so that the words have no meaning or if the book should be completely neglected, whether from malice or because men no longer need it, then neither the words nor the book will be of any use. They will lose their holiness. This applies as much to scripture as it does to other human writings. Quote number four, scripture is sacred and its statements divine just as long as it moves men to devotion toward God. Presumably, although Spinoza does not consider this point, the failure to move a reader toward justice and charity can derive either from some deficiency in the text or from some deficiency in the reader. A work of literature can be well or poorly crafted for achieving the desired moral effect. In this way, there does seem to be some element of objectivity to the divinity of a text, a feature of the work itself we can conceive of a work of literature that is so beautifully and effectively constructed and with such a clear and distinct moral message that under ordinary circumstances, it can reasonably be expected to edify and inspire its readers. It would be a work in which the word of God shines through consistently and without any ambiguity through characters and stories calculated to inspire the reader in the right way. And this seems to be precisely how Spinoza views scripture. Its authors, the prophets, may not have been philosophers or scientists, and so they did not enjoy special access to truths about nature, the cosmos, or God. But Spinoza insists, insists they were superior to other human beings in two respects. First of all, the prophets were endowed by nature and training with an especially strong ethical vision. This is quote number five. The prophets, he said, had a heart inclined only to the right and the good. The prophets are praised and so greatly commended, not for the loftiness and excellence of their understanding, 
but for their piety and constancy of heart. He doesn't tell us why the prophets have this moral insight. Uh, they don't get it from the way in which somebody might become morally virtuous through reading the ethics, that is, through philosophy. But he doesn't tell us what is the explanation for the prophet's superb moral character. Second, beyond being morally superior, the prophets were gifted with unusually vivid imaginations. Here he flips Maimonides on his head a bit. Like Maimonides, Spinoza believes that the ancient prophets had a more lively imaginative faculty, although he rejects Maimonides' claim that the prophets also had perfected intellects. So essentially Spinoza is saying Maimonides is right. The prophets had really vivid imaginations with a little bit of a, of a smirk, I think, when he says that. Thus, the prophets were particularly well-suited for moral storytelling, for crafting moving and inspiring narratives that convey the proper message, the universal law of God. Their writings reflect these special attributes of their authors by their distinctive power to move readers towards what is right and what is good. Now, it might be tempting, given what I've just said, to think that for Spinoza, the divinity of Scripture is also not just an objective matter of fact, but an intrinsic feature of the work. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, some, an intrinsic feature or property is a feature or a property of a thing that it has, regardless of its relationship to anything else. So the shape of this lectern is an intrinsic feature of the shape of the lectern. It doesn't depend upon where the chair is or who's standing before it. It is a feature that the lectern has independently of whatever else is the case in the world. The opposite of an intrinsic feature is a relational feature. I am the uncle of Sarah, not because of anything intrinsic about me, but because there is also this person called my, my brother, and he had a daughter named Sarah. So being the uncle of Sarah is not an intrinsic feature of me. It's a relational feature I have because of this relationship with which I stand to another person. So let keep that distinction in mind as we proceed. Is it the case that for Spinoza, the divinity of Scripture, if, Spino if, if Scripture is constructed in this really well-suited way, does it follow that the divinity of Scripture is an intrinsic feature of the work, something that the work has by virtue of its own properties. Simply a virtue of its an imaginative literary quality, the content and the presentation of its message. Indeed, sometimes it seems that Spinoza does regard the divinity of Scripture as an intrinsic qualitative feature of the text. Look at number six, quote number six on the handout. We must establish from Scripture alone that it teaches true moral doctrines, for only from this can its divinity be demonstrated. That looks like he's saying that all you need to know about the divi Scripture's divinity is the text itself. It's important to note, however, that no matter how objectively well-suited a book might be by its intrinsic features for inspiring justice and charity, it can always be misused. For example, by unscrupulous ecclesiastic authorities in Amsterdam seeking to use the Bible's portrayal of God to manipulate the hopes and fears of ordinary people in order to gain power and influence over them. Just as a corkscrew can be employed for nefarious purposes, like as a weapon, so can the Bible. And this, of course, is precisely Spinoza's great fear and concern in the theological political treatise, and why he says explicitly that what is called sacred and divine is what is destined for the practice of piety and religion, and it will be sacred only so long as people use it in a religious manner. He has seen the way the more orthodox leaders of the Dutch Reformed Church typically exploit the Bible for their own religious and political ends, encouraging in their flocks not justice and charity, but fear and prejudice. They are misusing the Bible. Still, in Spinoza's mind, there may be no work of literature better suited by its own qualitative character 
for inspiring justice and charity than the writings of the biblical prophets. And yet, in the end, for Spinoza, the divinity of scripture is not an intrinsic feature of the text. It's not something that is a function of the text's objective character alone. Rather, divinity must be primarily a relative, perhaps even a subjective affair. No matter how well composed the text may be for its moral purpose, no matter how clearly and imaginatively it proclaims the word of God, if it fails actually to have the proper edifying effect on its readers, then it is not divine. Let me explain this by bringing in another example. Uh, you signed up for a philosophy lecture tonight, so we're going to introduce all these distinctions. And it's a distinction within this category of relative properties. Something can have a relative property um, in two senses. First of all, it can have a particular quality as a bare capacity or power because of both its own features and because of the way other things are constituted. So salt, for example, has the property soluble in water because of the chemical constitution of salt and the chemical constitution of water. Even if salt never gets dissolved in water, never actually dissolves in water, it has this power but it's a relative power, a relative capacity, which it has only, not just because it's composed the way it is, but also because of something else, the way water's composed. A corkscrew, for some reason I, I really think corkscrews do a good job <laughs> here. A corkscrew has the wine bottle opening quality, both because of its own structure and the nature of cork bottle stoppers. According to, and even if a corkscrew is never used to open a bottle, it has that power, that relative power. <laughs> According to this sense, the Bible would have the property morally edifying readers, that's the property, and thus the quality divine, both because of its intrinsic literary features and the nature of human beings generally. In this sense, the Bible would be divine even if it never actually has a morally edifying effect on any person, just as long as it has the capacity to edify people by virtue of both its literary features and the natural constitution of the human mind. Now Spinoza says in the quote we just looked at that if the words of a text are so organized that according to their usage, they move the people reading them to devotion, then those words will be sacred. And this might seem to allow for divinity in this relative sense I just mentioned, as a bare capacity or power. However, I do not think Spinoza means that the mere capacity or potential or power of a work, by virtue of both its own intrinsic qualities and human nature, its, its power to inspire justice and charity in readers, I don't think he means that that alone is sufficient for the divinity of the work. In light of Spinoza's claim that scripture is sacred and its statements divine just as long as it moves men to devotion toward God, then although the intrinsic features of some text may be, given human nature generally, superbly conducive to moving people toward devotion, if in the end that text fails to achieve that end, if no one is ever actually so moved, then the work is not divine. Perhaps a more accurate way to put it is as follows. If a certain text actually moves a person toward justice and charity, then the text is divine or sacred for that person. If the same text does not move a different person toward justice and charity, then the text is not divine or sacred for that person. Spinoza could not be more clear. Okay, so that's, you should never say that about Spinoza. He couldn't be more clear because whatever you read in Spinoza, he could always be more clear. Um, but Spinoza seems relatively clear, not just about the relativity, but also the subjectivity of the divinity of scripture or of any text when he says, and this is quote number seven, nothing is sacred or profane or impure in itself outside the mind, 
but only in relation to the mind. Just as, according to Spinoza, things are good or bad, never in themselves, but only insofar as they bring about joy or sadness in a person. He's very clear throughout his entire philosophical works. Nothing in nature is good or bad in itself. Things are good if they bring joy and pleasure to a person. Things are bad if they bring sadness and pain. Well, similarly, nothing is sacred or divine except insofar as it has a certain moral effect upon a person. Of course, whether or not a text does have that effect on a person is an objective matter of fact. Scripture either does or does not move a person to justice and charity. And its success in doing so is not determined simply by that person wanting it to do so. In this respect, the subjectivism is mitigated somewhat. Uh, it's not an extreme subjectivism whereby a text is sacred if you want it to be sacred or if you think it's sacred. It's not that kind of subjectivism. Still, unless scripture or any writing has the requisite effect in the mind of a reader, it is not sacred or divine for that person. Spinoza's account of the divinity of scripture raises some really interesting philosophical questions. As I've mentioned, in Spinoza's view, while any work of human literature might satisfy the criteria for being divine, there may be no work of literature better suited by its own qualitative features for inspiring justice and charity than the collected writings of the biblical prophets. And yet, and here's my first question, might it not be possible for a work of fiction that is not scripture to be more divine than scripture? If the divinity of a work of literature is a function of its power actually to move people to justice and charity, it is certainly conceivable that some novel might be even more effective than scripture in doing this. In principle, that is, that is according to Spinoza's principles, there is no reason why this could not be the case. <coughs> Despite the fact that, in Spinoza's view, the authors of scripture were of the highest ethical character and especially gifted in terms of their imaginations and their narrative skills. That is, there appears to be no reason why an author might not come along who is both just as morally upright as the Hebrew prophets and even more talented as a motivational storyteller, with the result that her novel is superbly effective in inspiring its readers to treat their fellow human beings with loving kindness. Now, you might raise the following objection to the scenario I just described. Let's assume that the, um, sorry. Let's assume that the author of this allegedly divine novel is a devoted secularist and thus has included no God character in her work. So now the objection runs, if this novel makes no mention whatsoever of God or of any providential deity, um, if there's no character here who from, a who from a supernatural or at least um, supernal role is a model of mercy, loving kindness, and justice and charity and who commands us to act in certain ways, if there's no such character, then how could it possibly be the case that this novel motivates the reader to obedience to God's law? After all, if the work lacks any depiction of a divine lawgiver, how can a reader be moved by it to obey that divinity and its laws? However, I do not see why the presence of God as a character and a work of literature should be a necessary condition for that work to be divine in Spinoza's sense. Bear in mind that for Spinoza, obedience to God's law, strictly speaking, is nothing more than behavior that intentionally embodies justice and charity towards one's fellow human beings. And this would not, it seems to me, require that one be presented with a portrayal of God as a personal agent who acts in a certain way and commands certain things. The right story with the right characters could certainly do the work, even if there's no God character in that novel. Here's my second question. <coughs> 
An equally interesting but perhaps more difficult, difficult question is whether a work of literature composed, let's say, by an author who does not possess those moral virtues that Spinoza says were exemplified by the prophets. Imagine an author's book. Could it still be divine even if its contents are morally abhorrent? There was a novel that came out uh, in the United States in the 1980s called American Psycho. Do you know this novel? It's truly a disgusting piece of literature, and it's, no, it's nothing but um, crass violence, um, drug use, murder, mayhem uh, in New York City in the 1980s. There are no redeeming characters in this book. Can a work of fiction be, at the same time, both morally degenerate in its story, full of lust, murder, betrayal, with no morally redeeming characters, but unfailingly morally edifying in its effect upon its readers. Perhaps the horrific actions depicted in the work so frighten or shame or repel readers that they are thereby moved to act always in the most morally righteous ways and thus obey God's law. Maybe the work is revelatory of the darkest features of human nature that need to be restrained and no one who reads this novel fails to be properly edified, contrary to the author's malicious intentions. And thenceforth, the readers will always act with the best motives in accordance with God's commandments. It's hard to believe that Spinoza would regard such a work as divine, but it may be difficult for him to block that conclusion. All right, let me conclude with a final remark of what exactly it means to be morally edified by Scripture, to be moved by the text to obey God's, lo to obey God's law, to love God and one's neighbors. And here let me distinguish between, scripture, between Spinoza's two major philosophical treatises and their respective purposes, and acknowledge that there are for Spinoza two paths and two paths towards piety and virtue, or at least towards piety, towards pious and virtuous behavior. If we confine ourselves still to the theological political treatise, we are, provi we are provided with a fairly general but familiar set of moral prescriptions that Spinoza believes ordinary people are expected to derive from their reading of scripture and to obey if they, are, if they accept the work's fundamental theological teachings. As we've seen, the theological principles he has in mind are that God exists, that God is omnipotent, that God provides for the virtuous, and so on. The remaining moral precepts we also saw are to defend justice, to aid the poor, to kill no one, to covet nothing. And so a person who reads scripture will get that message and will be moved to, um, to exemplify those virtues in their own actions. And let me add here that the operative word is obey. The point of scripture's narrative is not to convey true knowledge of God, but to simply instill belief in God's moral attributes and thereby inspire obedience to God's commandments. In that sense, what scripture proclaims from Spinoza's perspective is false, because for Spinoza, God doesn't have any moral attributes. Nature just is. It's neither good nor bad. And yet these stories of scripture that portray God as a moral agent are highly effective in moving readers in the proper way. Not very unlike Plato's moral lie. By contrast, the impetus toward ethical behavior, toward justice and charity in the ethics, is not obedience inspired by fictitious stories, but knowledge and understanding. More precisely, in the ethics, virtuous action on the part of the rational and free person results not from imaginative beliefs about the psychology and ethical character of a God who acts as a moral agent, but rather from knowledge of God's true nature, that is, knowledge of nature itself. Spinoza's philosophically astute free person knows that the mind's true virtue is understanding, an intellectual achievement whereby one perceives one's place in nature and the necessity of all things. A person who reaches this level of intellectual achievement will know precisely why one should treat other human beings with justice, love, and charity, namely because it's in your own best interest to do so. Both the theological, so in that case, you're not 
imitating somebody else, you're acting from knowledge. Both the theological political treatise and the ethics are in agreement that the supreme moral achievement is to love God and to love one's neighbors and to treat fellow human beings with justice and charity. But there's an important difference in the ways in which the two works describe what all this means and how, one is supposed to be how it's supposed to be achieved. According to the theological political treatise, the moral message is grasped by the masses in an imaginative way through the inspiring stories of scripture. With the literary character God modeling good moral behavior and the love of God tantamount to obeying God's commandments and imitating God's portrayed behavior in one's own actions. In the ethics, by contrast, the intellectual love of God is simply the knowledge of nature, since God and nature are one and the same thing. And while the free person's goal is likewise to improve the lives of others, forgive their trespasses, the free person knows that what this means is that she is to act in such a way that those other people also become free and rationally virtuous. Moreover, the motivation for such moral activity in the free person is not obedience to some divine lawgiver and imitation of his actions, but rather rational self-interest. The free and rationally virtuous person knows what virtue really requires. They know, for, that is, that it is in their own best interest to be surrounded by other free and rationally virtuous individuals because they will be more useful to him in their striving for well-being in the life of rational virtue. It's like what Socrates, a lot like what Socrates says in the Apology. Remember, Socrates is on trial because he's accused of corrupting his fellow citizens. And he says, well, what do you think? I'm an idiot? Why would I want to live among corrupted fellow citizens? I have to live with these people. My goal, in fact, is to improve them because only then will I myself be able to practice virtue in the proper way. To the extent that Spinoza's ethics shows us the way toward a better life and virtuous action that is well grounded in knowledge and not the passions, it may be just as effective as the Bible in moving certain people to act justly and charitably toward others. By Spinoza's own criteria then, the ethics, his ethics, is for them a divine and sacred work. However, sometimes a few good fictional stories are more effective than a host of rigorously demonstrated philosophical principles. Thank you. And we have some time for questions. Please. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understand uh, yours and Spinoza's argument. Um, if we assume that everyone considered the scripture to be sacred and divine, then empirically we would have a just and charitable society. Uh, and if we don't have a just and, and charitable society, that might mean either that everyone doesn't agree that it's sacred and divine or some people don't read it. So can I just uh, modify the way you put your question? You said everyone considers it sacred and divine. Um, that would make it subjective in the sense it's not subjective. It's not that everybody has to consider it sacred and divine. It's just that everybody has to be moved towards justice and charity by the book. Let's say you think it's sacred and divine, but it doesn't move you to justice and charity. Then it's not sacred and divine. Is hey. it? Or who, somebody, anybody. So it, it, to re let me rephrase your question, if I may. If scripture moves, actually moves everybody to just and charitable behavior, then it is divine and sacred for everybody. Well, okay, but I'm trying to unpack it the other way around. Okay. If we live in a society that's not just and charitable, therefore... For that society, scripture is not divine. Or everyone in the society doesn't think that it's divine. Well, th there you go again with the subjective thing. Um, it's, not, it's not that they just fail to think it's divine. Um, they might, um, so let's take your scenario. Scripture fails to move everybody in the society. 
uh, to justice and charity. Therefore, scripture is not sacred divine in that society. In that society. But let's say everybody thinks it's, it's divine. That's not going to make it divine. <laughs> wait, wait. It's, it's one thing. Oh, it doesn't move then. You're exactly. It's one thing to merely. <laughs> it's one thing to merely think that the, the book is divine. It's another thing for it to actually move you. So does that help? No, that's a very important point. Yes, I. Thinking versus uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's what I tried to get across when I said there's two senses in which it's subjective. Uh, the way you described it made it subjective in a radical sense. If you think it's beautiful, it's beautiful. If you think it's divine, then it's divine. That is not Spinoza's view. Moreover, well, so. And there is no such thing as something being absolutely divine. Correct. That's why it's mere relatively, only relatively divine. Um, is it possible for a person to be moved to justice and charity by scripture and yet not think that it's divine? That seems unlikely. Because if, you, if you're feeling morally edified by a work of literature, it's hard to imagine that you're not aware that, this, that the work is having that effect upon you. So you might think it's divine and it's not divine, but if it is divine, you'll think it's divine. <laughs> Does that make sense? If it's divine, it has the effect upon you. You will know it has that effect upon you. Therefore, you'll know it's divine. But just because you think it's divine, it doesn't follow that it has that effect upon you. You have a false belief. But in terms of outcomes, what's really important is that if society is just and charitable, if it meet, reaches its goal. Exactly, yes. I'm good. You want me to call on people? I will answer questions. For the okay. It's a few. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, yes, I read your biography and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. I did not read the ethics because I felt like I would probably need to read it with some some guide or something. But at any rate, um, not exactly a lightweight. Uh, no, but I do know from having read about Spinoza. From in uh, encyclopedias and so on, uh, that one of his tenets was uh, the idea of the world unfolding um, through a principle of nature, of uh, rather necessity, excuse me, necessity. Things happen because they must happen for something. Now, that's uh, when we think about immorality, the first thing comes to mind, World War II. Okay, World War II. And I recently came uh, upon a quote uh, attributed to Churchill, who thought that um, World War II was an unnecessary war. He called it that. Um, just wondered what you think Spinoza might have thought about calling it an unnecessary war. It seems to be a kind of so there would have to be an ambiguity. There's going to have to be an ambiguity in the word necessity there. Uh, in one sense, whatever happens happens by virtue of the invariably causally determinative laws of nature. Um, and so physical powers and physical and mental emptiness, uh, uh, void. So nature hates a void and that sort of thing. So well, you know, no, nature doesn't hate or love anything. Okay. <laughs> um, whatever is, is. And whatever happens necessarily had to happen, not just in the physical world, but also in the world of our mental lives. That human beings, in their passions, their loves, their hates, their desires, their beliefs, it's as much law-governed and causally determined as billiard balls on a table and rocks rolling down hills. So in that sense, um, it cannot be said that any war is unnecessary, that is, not causally determined. Um, you should probably give other people a chance with the mic, but let me just finish answering your question. Um, the, there's another sense in which you could say it, it wasn't necessary in the sense that had other things gone differently, the war wouldn't have happened. But of course, for Spinoza, those other things couldn't have gone differently because they too were necessitated by antecedent causes. So I'm afraid that for Spinoza, to say that a, a war wasn't necessary um, is more wishful thinking than an insight into how things could have been different. Have to be radical answer, okay, you're welcome. The microphone's behind you. 
Uh, what, what do you think uh, Spinoza relationship to people that uh, think about morality and charity uh, but don't think that the scriptures are divine? So when you say they think about morality and charity, are their beliefs about more morality and charity true, justified beliefs? Do they have knowledge of these things, or do they just kind of have these imaginative ideas? Well, the idea of morality doesn't necessarily come from scripture That's for right. many people. And uh, so those people, uh, well, many people that don't think the scriptures are divine, how do they think, uh, they think that the sentence by Hillel that uh, uh, don't do to others what you don't like to be done to yourself and love thy neighbor like yourself is the basis of morality. You don't, maybe you don't need the scriptures to have this notion. No, that's absolutely right, and that's, that's a part of my argument. Um, let, let's say, in fact, that there's, there's three ways of becoming morally virtuous. One way is to read scripture and be inspired by its stories, and for you, then, scripture is divine. Uh, here's a second way. Um, you read Spinoza's Ethics. You know what true virtue and freedom and uh, the life of rational morality consists in. Um, and through this deep intellectual understanding of yourself, of nature, of the cosmos, you come to see why it is in your own best interest to treat other people with justice and charity. You have deep philosophical insight. That's a second path. Here's a third path, um, and this may be what most uh, people who don't regard scripture as divine would take. Something has moved them, and, and let's assume on the basis of your question that they really have true beliefs about justice and charity and that they practice, practice these in their lives. But they don't do it because they've read Spinoza. They don't do it because they've been moved by scripture. They do it because they read Shakespeare or they read Kant or they read John Stuart Mill's treatise on utilitarianism. Or um, let's take David Hume's theory. They are moved by a feeling of sympathy with other human beings to treat human beings in the same way that people who read the Bible are moved to treat other human beings. That seems to me all consistent with Spinoza's view here. As long as they really do act justly and charitably and that their beliefs about these things are true beliefs. Can you wait for the mic to come? Spinoza experienced some very severe cruelty from his Jewish community that held to the divinity of the scriptures. What did he, what would he say to that? They didn't read the scriptures properly? <laughs> um, well, if, if what they meant by the divinity of scripture is that it was literally authored by a supernatural being endowed with certain psychological and moral characteristics, then they have a superstitious belief of scripture. Um, however, you can have those false beliefs about God and still be morally moved in the proper way. And the fact that people who, most people who are moved by scripture towards moral behavior um, have false beliefs about God. They think of God in an anthropomorphic way. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Spinoza says that what he calls obedience to God requires a set of beliefs and Quite a few of the beliefs that Spinoza lays out, that God exists, that God rewards the virtuous and punishes the wicked, um, these beliefs are essential for obeying God's law. In other words, you, it might be that you can have very su false and superstitious beliefs about God. Those beliefs will motivate you to obey God's law and be just and charitable. That's perfectly fine because most people can't be philosophers. And it's important that they be just and charitable, so let them be just and charitable through those false beliefs. If, well, it's not important to be philosoph I think it is, but, you know. <laughs> uh, right. You don't have to be a philosopher to be a good person. Yeah. You don't have to be a philosopher to be a good person. And you can 
Yes. There are, there are many ways of becoming moral. Now, to go back to the premise behind your question, I think Spinoza regarded the, the leaders of the Amsterdam Jewish community. I, I'm not convinced that they really disagreed with Spinoza <laughs> on a lot of the things he has to say. Um, but there were... Um, there were I think there was social, there's a social and political dimension to the harem. But it, it, it's, I think it's also quite internal to that community. Um, these, a lot of the members of the Portuguese Jewish community at that time were, were um, refugees or descendants of refugees from Spain and Portugal, from Catholic backgrounds, and they were still being reintegrated into Judaism. And so the harem was used in Amsterdam at the time to help um, unify and create a normative Jewish community. And you have somebody like Spinoza saying the kinds of things that was clear was saying, you can't have that. So I don't want to be the one to <coughs> to alienate my audience by causing a calling a sermon otherwise. Thanks. So a slightly more historical question. So these things are really extraordinary and, and astonishing consider that they were written when they were written. Yeah. Only that then you take into account that at the very same time, very similar things were also written by Hobbes. Yes. So I know the He's theory is... Thomas Hobbes, the uh, English philosopher. Right, and I imagine it's a very not original question that you get sometimes. But um, And I know there are theories about whether they read each other or whether they both were relying on previous sources. Right. But still, the similarities are really striking. And the fact yeah. that they were written in a very similar anti-clerical context, so yeah. what do you make of uh, these so similarities? Ho Thomas Hobbes is a really interesting character because most people today think of him as a fusty conservative, um, somebody who, who will defend the, the absolute right of kings, and that sounds very reactionary. In fact, Hobbes was a radical, and when he read Spinoza's treatise, he says, oh my God, I would never write such a thing, but I think he thought a lot of it. Um, so Hobbes also denied that, the, that well, Hobbes claimed that Moses couldn't have written all of the passages of the Bible because Moses couldn't have written about his own death. Um, but then S Ibn Ezra said similar things as well. Um, I, I think that a lot of what Spinoza says about politics uh, in the ethics and in the theological political treatise only came to him in the latter 1660s when Latin and Dutch editions of Hobbes' works were available. So I think that there was quite an important influence of Hobbes on Spinoza. But I think his views about the Bible I think those predate his reading, reading of Hobbes. I think be because when, so he was excommunicated in 1656. He couldn't have read Hobbes yet because he didn't read English. Um, we know that in 1658, just two years after the, after the harem, um, some visitors to Amsterdam reported to the Inquisition that they met this man named Spinoza. And Spinoza says he was kicked out of the Jewish community for saying that God exists only philosophically, uh, the Bible is, uh, that the law is not true and that the soul dies with the body. So we know that right around the time of the harem, it, we have good reasons for thinking that he was saying just the kinds of things that will later appear in his treatises. So I think it's a really great question. Hobbes influenced Spinoza, but where and how much? Yeah. Wait, we have to wait for the microphone. And then you get the next question. Presented it as though Spinoza really believed that charity is a supreme value. But I think even the way you describe it, the ethics, which is directed towards philosophers, does not present it as such. Charity and ethics is very tangential. It's not. It doesn't. It's not a central part of the ethics. Even as you presented it, people should realize that it's in their best interest. So it's it serves a purpose. It's not sort of a supreme value in itself. I think the way I understand it, ethics was directed towards philosophers, and uh, the treatise was just directed towards ordinary people. And he wanted them to take this message out of the Bible. So let me by charity, I didn't mean giving money, giving charity in that sense. And I don't think that's what Spinoza means in the ethics or in the theological policy. What charity means is caritas. Um, working to improve the life of another person. But I think you're absolutely right. It's not the supreme value. It's something you do to help move you towards uh, the supreme value, which is freedom, virtue, uh, 
happiness, a beatitude, and um, activity. So does that help clarify that? My uh, question basically is, is it really the charity, either way, any way you present it, a major part of the ethics? Yes. I think it is. Um, because in part four of the ethics, so he has a very egoistic theory of human motivation. Whatever you do, you do because you are moved for, by self-preservation. Every, there's no altruistically motivated action. There are altruistic behaviors, but it's always motivated by the pursuit of your own, uh, maintaining and increasing your own power or activity. And in a series of propositions in part four, there's, and these are, I think these are very important propositions, he actually introduces um, how we ought to treat other human beings. We ought to treat them in ways so that we act, in s we act so that their lives are improved because it's in our own best interest to do so. That's, I think, his discussion of charity. That's what he means by charity there, acting charitably towards others, helping them achieve lives that are flourishing lives. No, no, but it, he's, he's demonstrating that it is in your own best interest. Now, you might disagree that the demonstrations fail. I mean, that's a legitimate point, but... I think this ties up to the increased murder. Murder for philosophers, murder for the other things. Um, so like, oh, is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you a wishy-washy answer. Yes and no. <laughs> um, <laughs> There, there are two kinds, there are two ways in which people can act charitably towards others. One way is the way in which it's uh, presented in the ethics. You act charitably towards others, you help improve their lives because you know with certainty it's in your own best interest. In the theological political treatise, you will act that way towards others, not because you're aware it's in your own best interest to do so, but because you're imitating the, the, uh, the behavior of this moral paradigm, this moral paradigm. Well, so he had his head up again. It sounds like he assumes that, uh, or Spinoza assumes that the the God of the Bible is just and fair and merciful. Yes. There's a lot of stories where he's not just and kind and merciful. Uh, does that mean that it's only divine in the sense that it motivates people to do things that Spinoza wants it to to, motiv to be motivated to do? Right. So um, you could put the following question to Spinoza. When God acts in morally, what seem to be morally reprehensible ways, is God doing that out of a sense of charity and justice and loving kindness um, to scare us or to warn us? Um, or is that, that so that would be one way uh, of explaining away those sorts of passages. Uh, the other way of explaining them away would be to say that, well, you know, s the prophets not being learned theologians had false beliefs about God and sometimes those get expressed in these depictions of God's behavior that don't really seem consistent. But this, you know, this really does seem to be a, a challenge to Spinoza's claim that if uh, Tony Grafton once said to me, I, I said, well, you know, can imagine a Bible that depicts God in awesomely fearful and frightening ways and Grafton said, yeah, that's Calvin's Bible. Um, so I, I think it really is hard to, to see how Spinoza can say that. Um, just maybe to put the question of the two Spinozas in a different way, um, my question is, uh, did really Spinoza think that the Bible is really moral? Because when you read it at face value, there are many chapters, I would argue, even the um, majority of the chapters from Spinoza's point of view are not so moral, and he has so many, he has some uh, comments on this in the, in the Tractatus. So the idea to portray the Bible as moral and charitable is basically because of political reasons, not really because he thought that the text itself conveys moral ideas. So it's, it's more political than, you know, really essential in that sense, because most of the chapters that you read in the Bible, if you look at them from, I would say, a moral, a purely moral point of view, are basically immoral. You go chapter after chapter, and I, I, I'm, I'm all, I'm convinced that Spinoza knew that. So are you, are you I make some comments about this, you know, along the treaties. Many places, I think this is the, I would say, a certain layer of, 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 of 
his composition. If I so, are you suggesting that he's being disingenuous when he says no, that? No, because, because the whole purpose of this treaty is, is political and educational, and he wants to use it as a vehicle for educating, in his views, the multitude. And to do this is to convince them that this is a moral book, though he's not himself convinced that it's really a moral book. Mm -hmm. Because it's not really a moral book from his point of view. You read the stories about Abraham, for example, most of them are immoral. Well, it's not so much that every character, uh, his claim is not that every character in the Bible is a moral character. And it's not the case that every story is on its face a moral story, but rather that the stories themselves are morally edifying. I think your, your reading is best captured, going back to this question, that God, is, is because he's only supposed to be one morally uh, paradigmatic character, at least as I read Spinoza, and that's God. Yes, but I'm not sure that Spinoza thought that the God as a character of the Bible is moral. Okay. Because in most cases, he's not moral even in the Bible as, yeah. a, as a character. No, I think, so that's, I mean, I think that's a legitimate answer to this question that, well, Spinoza didn't mean it when he said Yes, it. but the, yet it, w it was extremely important for him to portray him as moral because of political reasons. Right. Yeah, sure. I would like to read uh, the, the, the quote number four. Uh, the scripture is sacred and a statement divine just as long as it moves into devotion towards God. Now, since God has no moral attributes, why shouldn't we understand moving devotion to God like scientific? God is could have nothing to do with morals because you know if you understand the powers, the laws of nature, wouldn't we put divinity in another sense? Um, in an ideal world, yes, but I think Spinoza believes that most people were they. I, I think it's clear that he believes that were most people not to have those superstitious beliefs about God as a moral agent, um, they would not be moved to obey God's law. Because he lays out those seven, the seven tenets of the universal religion. He says that those are not just sufficient for obeying God's law, but necessary. And so you need, um, you need this devotion towards God as the kind of God that you find uh, people addressing with reverential awe and so on. It, you know, it would be great if everybody could express devotion to God in the way in which the philosopher in the ethics expresses devotion to God. But I think a, at a certain point, even it, you know, even the, the in the political treatise, he says, "I'm writing this for human beings, not as we want them to be, but as as they are." And I think there's a sense in which the, the theological political treatise also is a concession to human nature in that sense. Look, most people aren't going to be philosophers; um, they're going to get. They're going to be inspired. And even if he doesn't, go back to your point, even if he doesn't really believe that God is a consistently moral character, I think he does believe that the Bible is going to be the best thing we have for inspiring um, justice and charity among its readers. Yeah. Okay, um, can you shout? Okay, shout. One minute. Hi. Um, my question is, it seems clear that you think, and I think Spinoza does think as, as well, that not everyone can be philosophers and that the best thing to do is to understand God truly and then to understand yourself truly, and then you, wi you will be moral, but really moral to some extent. And <clears throat> I'm wondering if you take that uh, conclusion of Spinoza seriously enough to say something like, well, maybe it wasn't possible 400 years ago, maybe it is now. <laughs> 
Have you been following politics in the United States? <laughs> um, I am, but um, I want to keep optimistic. Okay. And to try to understand, are we moving forward anyway, or is it still? Uh, good point. Well, well, well taken. Um, it, it just seems to be a particularly uh, shining example right now. Um, no, I, you know, if you look at the, at the world, there seems to be um, as much stupidity and superstition operating as there was in the 70s. You know, maybe not as much, but of a different nature. But um, you know, we, we could be hopeful that we've made some kind of progress towards philosophical lives. But the empirical evidence. Right. So then, then the question is whether the empirical evidence suggests that Spinoza was wrong or that we are wrong in interpreting him. Oh, wait. Wrong about what? <laughs> is, the, is the empirical evidence say that Spinoza was wrong in, in, in saying, or I'll reframe it. Is it still the case that most people cannot really move forward to philosophic understanding of the world? Or did we not take Spinoza serious enough in finding a way he might suggest us to help people? or help more people or something like that because yeah. I do think more people today are educated, moral, um, better than they are in the 17th century to some extent. They are, they're certainly better educated in a formalistic sense. Um, but I still think, you know, rem remember the last line of the ethics, all things uh, excellent are as difficult as they are rare. Uh, and by all things excellent, he means achieving this, this state of, of intellectual excellence, this condition of rational virtue. And I think it's no less true now than it was then that it's a difficult and rare condition to achieve. Um, you know, students uh, go to university, but the number of humanities majors is de declining because they're going to university and they're, they're told they should go to university um, because that's the path to a career. Even Obama at one point, a couple of years ago in a speech, said, you know, don't major in our history. Don't." Don't major in a humanities discipline. We need engineers and scientists. So people are getting more educated, but I don't see that um, we live in a more philosophically astute world now. But that's just, I, I've, got a, I've got a really bleak perspective these days. <laughs> um, so I'm, I may be still young to be optimistic, but I think that's one of our challenges. Yeah, isn't great. It? <laughs> <laughs>